Good morning, everyone. And my name is Nicole Mitchell again. I'm the director of jazz studies at University of Pittsburgh. I want to welcome you to the 50th annual jazz seminar. Today, we're so excited to co host the Feed the Fire Symposium with Columbia University to celebrate the incredible pianist, scholar, visionary, educator, and friend, Jerry Allen. The world around us feels much in disarray right now. And I think we're really in need of some positive things to focus on. And I'm really thankful that today we will be uplifted by this incredible roster of internationally renowned scholars and musicians all brought together to share the library of musical wisdom and educational innovations made by Jerry Allen. I wanna definitely thank my faculty colleague, Michael Heller, and also our faculty colleague at Columbia University, Ella, Ellie Hizama, for doing this work that is so important and necessary to bring um, everyone more understanding and acknowledgement of Jerry Allen's contribution to the jazz field and to jazz education. This is very personal for me because I'm standing in her shoes and those are some really big <laughs> shoes to fill. Um, I just wanted to say just a few words about my own inspiration of Jerry. I'll try to keep it short. Jerry knew how to remain open on all sides in the middle through her telematic adventures with ACM luminary George Lewis and in her unlimited ability to fly towards the sound. Didn't everyone know that she'd taken Mary Lou to the next level? Jerry, who had created exceptional music with Charlie Hayden, Paul Motion, Ingrid Jensen, David Murray, Dave Holland, Terry Lynn Carrington, and many others always maintained her honest and humble centeredness and full commitment to the music. Her presence was both equalizing and empowering. Her sparkling eyes said, yes, as a woman instrumentalist and composer, you can be true to yourself. You can create the music you dream of. And in spite of what you've been told about how treacherous this business is, you can connect with good people out there and they will be the ones you find community with. I believed I could pursue my place in jazz because I heard Jerry Allen doing it. I felt solace in her sage-like smile while she playfully knocked down other pianists with her cascading virtuous touch and, her, and keyed our consciousness into her incredible sonic realms. Jerry, a quiet voice that spoke with genius ideas, had powerful fingers that sang with fearless and calculated fire. It is more than an honor to be standing in her big shoes right now at University of Pittsburgh. I have so much to live up to, and I'm hoping today brings great new revelations. I want to pass the mic now on to my colleague, Farah Jasmine Griffin. Thank you so much, Nicole. You've said so much already about Jerry. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Feed the Fire, a cyber symposium in, in honor of the great, great Jerry Allen. I'm Farah Jasmine Griffin, Chair of the African American and African Diaspora Studies Department here at Columbia University, which sits on the land of the Muncie Lenape people. I bring you greetings and I'm thrilled to welcome you. I'm also thrilled that we are one of the co-sponsors of this magnificent event. And I'd like to thank my fellow co-sponsors, um, the Society of Fellows and the Heyman Institute at Columbia University, the Institute for Research in African American Studies, the University of Pittsburgh's music department and jazz studies program. And even more so, as Nicole said, I wanna thank the people who work so hard to pull this together, Michael Heller at University of Pittsburgh, my colleague, Ellie Hasama here at Columbia University's Department of Music and Kay Zhang, who's been keeping us all on track. A day devoted to the life and music of Jerry Allen, who was one of my dearest friends, a sister friend, one of my most treasured collaborators and a true genius of this music that we call jazz, a true genius of music of any genre and form. I know that Jerry belonged to University of Pittsburgh, but we here at Columbia claimed her as well. She was one of our first artists in residence at the Institute for Research in African American Studies, insisting, insisting always that her residency be shared with the local community. So we went into Harlem high schools and different kinds of community programs in addition to the master classes and things that she taught here. She was a frequent guest of our jazz study group. Uh, she was always 
welcome here. And when she came, she shared with us not only her brilliance, which was on display anytime she sat down at the piano or in any conversation with her, but even more importantly, she shared with us her generosity. She was one of the most generous people I know, both in person and musically, artistically, just an incredible genius. As Nicole said, she was a soft spirit, but a powerhouse when she sat down behind that piano. And she also shared her light. And I feel like today, in this moment, um, this difficult time, this time of anxiety, that we need all of those things that Jerry would share with us, her brilliance, her generosity, her light, and I think we're gonna get some of it. Thank you for being here, enjoy the day. Thank you so much to Professor Griffin and Professor Mitchell uh, for those beautiful remarks uh, to get started this incredible day. Uh, and thank you to everyone attending right now and braving Zoom fatigue. I know we've all been on screens a lot, so it's especially wonderful to see so many people here bright and early uh, in the morning. Uh, my name is Michael Heller. Uh, I'm a, a faculty member, a colleague of uh, Professor Mitchell at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, as the, was mentioned, I had directed the, this symposium along with Eli Hasama. Um, so I have sort of two roles in my opening remarks this morning. The first is to give a general introduction to the day itself uh, and to the panel, as well as to the special issue that's coming out of our journal Jazz and Culture which is devoted to Jerry Allen, it's titled The Power of Jerry Allen, and will be out in December. And the symposium today sort of extended and grew out of, of that work, particularly the morning panel. Uh, and then in the second half of my remarks, I'm going to speak a bit about Jerry Allen's 1983 master's thesis from the University of Pittsburgh, which we're gonna be publishing in its entirety uh, in the journal and, and for which I wrote a, a brief introduction. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge from the outset that the journal itself is uh, the output and wouldn't exist without the hard work of Jerry Allen. When she took over as Pitt's Director of Jazz Studies in 2014, Jerry was firmly committed to continuing many of the initiatives that had been started at Pitt by her predecessor, Nathan Davis, and one of these was the publication of an academic journal. So from the very first stages when we were relaunching the journal, it was she who advocated for support and funding from the university, who contacted the editorial board and generally laid the groundwork for us to relaunch the journal, which we did uh, in 2018. Uh, sadly, Jerry never had the opportunity to see it in publication as, as our first issue came out some months after she passed. Um, but uh, uh, Jerry also was the person who both hired me at Pitt and asked if I could serve as editor for the journal. And that's just one of many things I'm incredibly grateful to her for on a professional level and on a personal level. She's just a, a tremendous inspiration to, to my life. Uh, I'll add also uh, that the journal is still new. Uh, and so we are still actively searching for subscribers. It's hard to, to get a journal off the ground uh, in the current budget climate. Uh, so if you are interested in reading it, uh, we have in the program for today, there's a page about the journal and uh, information about how to subscribe or, or uh, encourage your institutions to subscribe so that you can get the Jerry Allen issue when it comes out in December. Next, I want to uh, echo the thanks to everyone uh, that was involved in planning this symposium today, uh, particularly our sponsors, as mentioned by Professor Griffin. And I particularly want to express my thanks to, to my co-organizer in this, the wonderful Ellie Hasama. Uh, I want to make sure everyone knows from the outset that today's conference was Ellie's idea uh, at the outset, that as we were finishing up the manuscripts from the journal, she emailed with the idea of, hey, why don't we have a symposium to, to celebrate the journal? Uh, and everything that we're going to see today just grew out of there. Uh, and so I'm so grateful to you, Ellie. You've been an absolute inspiration to work with throughout this process. So thank you for everything. Uh, I also want to give a brief acknowledgement to the staff working behind the scenes today, uh, including the wonderful staff of the Heyman Center for the Humanities at Columbia, uh, including Kei Zhang, Tess Shalafor Draymond, and Leslie Schramm, who are working tirelessly behind the scenes all day today, as they have been for weeks, uh, and our two uh, graduate 
uh, coordinators on the symposium, Noah Rosen and Lee Kaplan, who are also here. And finally, our wonderful jazz administrator at Pitt, Frank Hammond, who's been making so much happen behind the scenes. So, so wanted to thank you all. Finally, in addition to thanking all of the fantastic panelists and speakers who are able to participate today, I also want to express our apologies for everyone who isn't on the schedule. And we have a long list of people who we would have loved to invite who have deep connections with Jerry professionally, personally, and otherwise. Uh, Professor Allen just accomplished so much and she touched so many lives in so many places. So today really only scratches the surface of that. Uh, what we can say, however, is that we envision this event today and this journal issue not as a culmination of Jerry Allen scholarship, but rather as a beginning. Uh, and that's why I'm very happy to announce that our journal is intending to publish a second issue of Jerry Allen scholarship five years from now in 2025. Uh, that's an intentionally long lead time and we're doing that uh, on purpose so that if you have Jerry Allen research that's already in the works or even if you have a germ of an idea of a project that you're thinking about as a future article, we wanna leave enough time to see those seeds bear fruit and really make sure that, that uh, Jerry is recognized in the scholarly world uh, to the extent that a giant of her stature deserves to be. So anyone can feel free to reach out to me uh, today or, or after today, and I'm happy to work with you uh, on that. And maybe with some luck, we can even reconvene this five years down the road, either online or gasp, maybe in person to, to share further reflections uh, about Jerry and her legacy. So the format for the morning session is going to be as follows. The morning session is made up of each of the authors from the journal issue. And each speaker is going to speak for about 15 minutes outlining the topic of their article. They're not going to be reading the full articles themselves, which would take more time than we have, but they're going to be giving a general overview and the arc of their argument. And then, of course, the full versions will be available in the issue when it comes out. The final speaker of the morning is then going to be uh, Sherry Tucker, who has wonderfully and graciously offered to serve as a respondent today. So we're very happy to have Dr. Tucker here as well. A note for the audience as well, throughout the morning, uh, you should see a little question and answer box on your screen uh, where you're welcome to submit any questions that you have for the panelists. Uh, it's not an open chat box, uh, so these questions will come into us and then once all the panelists have spoken at about 11.45, we've left about a half hour to 45 minutes for questions from the community. Uh, so I'll go back through those and select questions to read uh, from among those submitted. Uh, but again, you can feel free to write them in at any time and then, then we'll circle back to them at that portion. Uh, and I'll offer my apologies in advance that uh, I likely won't be able to get to every question submitted, but we definitely wanna have an opportunity for back and forth and engagement with all of you who are joining us today. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to now change hats from my moderator role to my editor role to discuss this piece that we're going to be including in the special issue. And that is going to be Jerry Allen's 19, see on the cover page here, uh, by a committee that was chaired by Pitt's director of stu jazz studies, Nathan Davis, that's his signature at the bottom, who was joined on the committee by ethnomusicologist Bell Young and the organist and scholar of classical organ repertoire, Donald Beekman. In publishing the thesis in our journal this year, we really aim to offer it to the world as two things simultaneously. First, it's a brilliantly detailed study of Dolphy. And secondly, we offer it as a window into Jerry Allen's own development as a scholar and artist during this period of her life. Uh, it's useful to situate that period. So Allen's time at Pitt certainly wasn't the beginning of her journey as an artist as students of her life will be well aware. By the time she got to Pitt in 1979, she had already had a series of formative musical experiences in both her native Detroit, where she attended the legendary Cast Tech High School and studied with trumpet master Marcus Belgrave, as well as at Howard University, where she graduated from their jazz studies program under the mentorship of faculty like Arthur Dawkins and Fred Irby III. She wasn't yet known to the general public at this point, that would come a few years later, but she was already beginning to develop a reputation among musicians by word of mouth as a brilliant artist who was on the rise. It's notable though, that rather than going on to pursue a performance degree or diving directly into a playing career, she came to Pitt where the program was a broad ranging liberal arts program in ethnomusicology. 
Nathan Davis's presence was undoubtedly the biggest draw uh, in bringing her to the University of Pittsburgh, but the wide scope of her studies while she was in the program is reflected in interesting ways throughout the thesis. Uh, and I get into this more in the, the full introduction. Uh, the document itself is structured in two parts as, as indicated by the title. Uh, the first is a biography, and then the second is a transcription and analysis of three Dolphy performances. Uh, and those performances are uh, Serene, uh, his solo on the standard You Don't Know What Love Is, and the, the classic Out to Lunch. Now, in some ways, the choice of Dolphy as the subject of her thesis might seem like a surprising one. For instance, for all of Allen's later work as a master of the jazz piano tradition, here she chooses to analyze a wind player primarily through single note solos. And rhythm section work actually plays a somewhat minimal role throughout the document. Perhaps equally surprising is the thesis's complete lack of reference to women artists, which was an omission that's all too common in jazz literature, but is nevertheless a bit surprising in light of the degree to which Allen would celebrate the influence of powerful women in her later work. Yet in the introduction, I suggest that the choice to focus on Dolphy might be understandable in terms of several other factors relating to Allen's work. Uh, and here in the time remaining, I'll just focus on one of those, which is Dolphy's significance as a musical innovator who both deeply engages with, but also fearlessly extends the long tradition of black music making. This theme appears in several places in the document, but maybe the most telling is Allen's repeated deployment of a theory of African improvisation that was proposed by another Pitt faculty member, the West African music specialist, Kwabena Nkatia. Allen quotes Nkatia as suggesting that uh, improvisation in African music takes place in two primary ways. Uh, and those are as follows, so this A and B. So A, it takes place as a technique of performance by which a given or known piece is recreated or varied to a greater or lesser extent while being performed. And it takes place as B, a technique of extempore composition by which a piece is invented and shaped simultaneously through performance. What Allen does is she maps these models of engagement and traditional extension on one hand and then on new collaborative collaboration on the other onto an understanding of jazz and African-American music in ways that are more detailed than I'll have time to dig into uh, in this introduction today. But key to the argument is Dolphy's powerful example as an artist who straddled the line between the paradigmatic elements of the black music tradition and the most adventurous and experimental avenues of the avant-garde. I'll say that of course Dolphy is not by any means the only figure that one could choose in this regard. Uh, and another obvious choice might be Mary Lou Williams, uh, who Jerry would engage with deeply in subsequent years as is well known. But with these topics in mind, Alan's choice of Dolphy might be a bit more clear that she saw in Dolphy a figure with the simultaneous ability to look forward and backward a model that she saw as carrying broader lessons about processes of jazz improvisation. Here, uh, to close up, I'll just suggest that I believe a similar focus would powerfully animate Allen's own artistic work. Because for all of her many forms of historical engagement throughout her career, Allen's connection with jazz's past was almost never in the mode of a literal recreation. My favorite example of this is her 2006 album, Zodiac Suite Revisited, which was a work that resurrected Mary Lou Williams' Zodiac Suite for the first time in 50 years. And while many commentators have talked about this album in terms of its archival significance, and it is insignificant in that sense, when you listen to it, it's equally noteworthy how much Jerry departs from the Williams originals that this is by no means just a mere repertory band, that this is a project that's designed from the ground up as an extension and as a revisiting uh, of Williams's work. And Alan did this over and over again in her projects. She had no interest in conceptions of jazz that would divide it into factions of mainstreams and avant-garde, right turns and wrong ones, moldy figs or modernists. Instead, all directions provided vibrant and continually fresh avenues for exploration within a framework of tradition and respect. She wasn't afraid to change the music, but as Fred Moten suggested in a previous issue of our journal, and I'm gonna quote uh, Dr. Moten here, quote, it's like we take care of 
the songs that take care of us by changing them, just as they care for us in changing us, end quote. So Alan, I would suggest, like Dolphy, followed a similar muse. She heard history not as a tether to the past, but as a springboard to a living future. And her thesis anticipates this important and longstanding commitment in her career. Uh, my time is up there, so I'm going to leave it there for today uh, in terms of this general introduction. Um, but I encourage everyone to, to uh, uh, get and read the full thesis, and thank you for the opportunity to speak on that today. So with that, I'm going to put the moderator hat back on uh, and introduce our next speaker uh, and my co-organizer for the events today, Eli Hasama. Eli Hasama is a professor of music in the music theory and historical musicology areas uh, at Columbia University. Her work focuses on the visual arts, dance, film, theater, collaborative works, and public engagement. She's the author of Gendering Musical Modernism, the music of Ruth Crawford, Marion Bauer, and Miriam Gideon, and uh, of essays on Asiaphilia in American and British popular music, Isaac Julian's film installations, Afro-Asian hip hop, and equity in the field of music theory, uh, among other many fabulous projects. Uh, her article in the journal and her remarks today are titled, Jerry Allen and the Whole Feeling of Connection. So please join me in welcoming the wonderful Eli Hasama. Thank you so much. Um, I will screen share as soon as Michael takes the screen share down. Okay. I would like to begin by acknowledging the many of us who are speaking from the unceded traditional land of the Lenape. This land is known today as Harlem, located in Upper Manhattan. I wish to recognize the history of colonization and settlement here, the land on which Columbia University sits since its founding in 1754 by royal charter of King George II of England. We must remember that the US government forced the migration of the Lenape from this land to Oklahoma where many descendants of those who were removed now reside. The violence of this removal underwrites the history of this academic institution and all who live and work in Harlem. In recognizing this painful history, we can commit to the hard and necessary work of addressing injustices through our resolve and actions towards a more just world. Um, before I begin, I would like to thank our ASL interpreters, uh, Frank Perales and Ariel Johnson. They will be alternating throughout the day, and thank you so much. I would also like to acknowledge the photographer Barbara Weinberg Bearfield. Her photos were in the slideshow that preceded the opening remarks, and she has such beautiful photos, many of Jerry Allen and the Detroit jazz scene from the 70s until today. There's information about her book, Jazz Space Detroit with text by Herb Boyd on page 23 of your program booklet. And that is linked in the chat. As a graduate student in the 1990s, eager to immerse myself in engagements by women in 20th century musical practices, especially by those working in areas dominated by men, I was excited to discover Jerry Allen's compositions and playing in her magnificent debut album, The Printmakers. Powerful and delicate, elemental and intricate, full of fire and feeling, and testifying to a singular imagination, the music of this virtuoso artist caught my ear and ignited a decades-long interest. Allen's elegant and deeply spiritual synchronization of her multi-layered work as composer, arranger, pianist, collaborator, and educator draws upon her seemingly unlimited reservoirs of knowledge about the work of her predecessors. Deeply knowledgeable about a history in which women are not merely ornamental figures, but are central forces in jazz theory and practice she counters the narratives of male lineage 
that have dominated many scholarly and popular accounts of jazz. Allen's multimodal expression of knowledge is part of the emergent history of Black women intellectuals whose ideas arise from and circulate within many sites. In exploring sound-based modes of knowledge production, we can, in the words of Mia Bay, Farrah Griffin, Martha Jones, and Barbara Savage in their edited volume, Toward an Intellectual History of Black Women, listen for, quote, the history of ideas that is embedded in the lives and labors of African diaspora women, end quote. By forging new narratives about jazz that include and foreground women, Allen establishes herself as a producer of ideas and a vital part of Black women's intellectual history. In her book, Beyond Respectability, the Intellectual Thought of Race Women, Brittany Cooper argues that, quote, if we actually want to take Black women seriously as thinkers and knowledge producers, we must begin to look for their thinking in unexpected places. We expect its incursions in genres like autobiography, novels, news stories, medical records, organizational histories, public speeches, and diary entries, end quote. Jeffrey M. Hayes, curator of the marvelous exhibition, Augusta Savage, Renaissance Woman, connects Cooper's statement about the need to locate Black women's work as intellectuals in unexpected places to the visual arts, quote, especially art making and art spaces. Hayes argues that Savage, a sculptor, educator, and activist, quote, enlisted the visual arts as a means to shape the values and social work of Black people. In writing about choreographer and dancer Pearl Primus's work during World War II, Farrah Griffin observes that dance was the vehicle through which Primus in expressed her intellectual and political commitment. As Tammy Kernodal has persuasively argued, homes of intellectual leaders such as Mary Lou Williams, Estelle Bonds, Alice Coltrane, and Alelia Walker served as havens for musicians in need of care, community, safety, and respect for their ideas and work. These and other Black women functioned as, in her words, important agents in the progression of Black intellectual culture." End quote. Becoming aware of the ideas exchanged in nonverbal modes of artistic expression that include music, dance, sculpture, painting, and other performing and visual arts necessitates that we place Allen's work within this vibrant intellectual history. Allen's knowledge production is evident in a series of scenes. As a faculty member at Howard University, New England Conservatory of Music, the New School, Michigan, and Pittsburgh. She often spoke from within the academy, sharing her ideas about the history, technique, and art of music with musicians, students, and scholars through her teaching, ensemble leading, and administrative commitments. Her work as a composer, arranger, pianist, band leader, and collaborator further casts her footprint as a formidable intellectual. Interviews and conversations with Allen, writings and recollections by others about her and by her constitute an archive of some of her intellectual work that significantly alters the familiar history of jazz as a history of the work by men. The history that Allen builds is one in which women and men are contributors and innovators in the tradition of which she is a part. In a residency at Columbia University Center for Jazz Studies in 2008, Allen noted the connection of spirituals to the ancestors. In a masterclass with Allen, the composer and pianist Courtney Bryan, who was featured later today in a talk and piano performance, Courtney at the time was a DMA student in composition at Columbia here in the Department of Music, performed her own arrangement of the spiritual wade in the water. What's the what's different than the traditional? So 
play the Could you please, okay. yeah, just demonstrate the traditional first. So normally I guess it's played um, a lot more calm or more, more solemn, I think. And then could you play your version to the, um, the melody? Beautiful. There's a power in this um, that I feel immediately that comes from uh, more than we can see. And I think it's, for me, it's like uh, I, I begin my concerts with a spiritual as well. And I think that there's something about an acknowledgement. I'm sorry to have my back to you all. But there's a, something about an acknowledgement of the history, uh, the experience of the people that created this music by doing a, a libation, so to speak, a musical tribute in the beginnings of the concerts. For me, whenever I do that, there's a, uh, a sense of, of, of clarity that comes no matter where I am, no matter what kind of hall, what kind of instrument, what the challenges of whatever, uh, you know, the environment might be. And when I hear you play this, you know, for me, it's a it's, I think it, it's a connection. It, it connects us in a way to the legacy of the music in its early, uh, the ancestors, the, the whole feeling of the, you know, the connection of all of these people that made it possible for us to be here doing what we're doing now. So I applaud you for that. I think it's important that that is continued uh, and that we find, you know, that that lives. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention with the left hand, as you're doing the left hand figure, I'd be interested to hear your some more uh, single line, challenge yourself some more. You know, you're playing this feeling of butt pile in the left hand, which reminds me of um, what is that? Um, Paco Loco. Yeah. Yes. So I'm hearing all of that energy in your left hand. I'd really like to hear that uh, energy in the right hand as well. You want to try a little bit? The historical connections Ellen draws in offering these reflections about Brian's arrangement and performance of Wade in the Water before proceeding to more technical discussion of Brian's harmonic choices and her use of the left and right hands vividly demonstrates Ellen's keen sense of the ancestors, an appreciation for the traditional and the modern, and the importance of sharing this lineage with a younger developing artist. The whole feeling of the connection is, in Alan's words, more than we can see, a deeply spiritual feeling that connects the musician and her listeners to the ancestors, the family into which the musician is born, the people who made it possible for us to be here doing what we're doing. Alan's instruction to Brian addressed aspects of technique, the importance of knowing Cal's work, and what Brian identifies as the larger vision. As pianist Jason Moran observed about Alan, she taught us how to see ourselves and our ancestors in the music. After Alan's death in 2017, 
writer and musician Greg Tate recalled J.T. Lewis's words about Alan. He went there and just said it. If Jerry was a man, she'd have been celebrated as a giant a long time ago. Those who knew Alan recalled that she was very soft-spoken, introspective, a woman of few words but significant action, and possessing a quiet dignity, grace, and generosity. Rather than dwelling in interviews on the effects of gender bias on her training or career, Alan highlighted the contributions to jazz by other women, including Mary Lou Williams, Lil Hardin Armstrong, Lovey Austin, Terry Pollard, and Betty Carter. Vera Griffin offers two reasons for Alan's emphasis on history and tradition. First, that she, quote, feared an effort to de-emphasize jazz as an African-American form, a living tradition whose practitioners need to know, acknowledge, and honor it as a product of Black culture. Second, that she desired to influence and inform the way that history was represented so that women and avant-garde artists were not marginalized or ignored. Allen's determination to convey the importance of Williams and other women in the history of jazz was manifest in her work as a composer, performer, collaborator, and educator. Through her advocacy, teaching, and performance of Mary Lou Williams' work, Allen's work to underscore the importance of the history in which Williams and other women were fundamental contributors. Through her composing, performing, mentorship, talks, and teaching, Alan stitched together a compelling narrative of jazz, one deeply connected to the ancestors and animated by an inclusive vision of those who innovated. In Alan's words, our heroes would say, this is your culture, embrace it. You don't wanna lose who you are. And that's what happens when you don't embrace your culture, you disappear. These aspects of acknowledging and celebrating the music's roots empower the music when it remains connected to its source. Studying Alan's rich archive of work in sound and grasping her contributions as a person of ideas are fundamental to gaining a more comprehensive understanding of jazz, American music, and indeed music history and theory writ large. She and other women artists are central rather than peripheral in this new narrative about jazz that she helped to write, circumventing the woman in jazz paragraph that check the diversity box in male-centric lineages. Exploring the storehouse of knowledge and ideas present in the work of artists intellectuals such as Alan, whose tremendous achievements were not fully recognized during their lifetimes, is a necessary step towards acknowledging and honoring our predecessors and becoming keenly aware of the luminous presence of more than we can see. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Hasama. Okay, uh, we're going to keep moving uh, to our next speaker. Uh, who is composer, pianist Vijay Iyer. Uh, Vijay Iyer has released 23 albums and has collaborated with artists like Amiri Baraka, Wadada Leo Smith, Carrie Mae Weems, Teju Cole, Pamela Z, Henry Threadgill, Jennifer Cole, the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, Prashant Bhargava, and many others across disciplines. Uh, he's also the Franklin D. and Florence Rosenblatt Professor of the Arts at Harvard University, where he teaches in the departments of music and African American studies and advises the doctoral program in creative practice and critical inquiry. His publications appear in the Oxford Handbook of Critical Improvisation Studies, the Oxford Handbook of Critical Concepts in Music Theory, Jazz and Culture, and the forthcoming Sounding Together, Collaborative Perspectives on U.S. Music in the 21st Century. His article in the journal and his presentation today uh, are titled, The Deft, Quiet Shout of Her Hands, Jerry Allen's Speculative Musicalities. Vijay Iyer. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, it's amazing to be here to see so many of you popping up in the chat in the Q&A, many friends and colleagues and esteemed elders. Uh, I'm really honored to be here. I speak to you from Muncie, Lenape, and Wappinger land, also known as Harlem on the island of Manhattan. Thank you to our dear organizers, Michael and Ellie, for convening this stellar gathering today. I'm honored to be a part of this celebration of our dear departed Jerry Allen, a hero, friend, teacher, and genius 
of modern music. I also wanna give thanks to the black communities of Detroit on whose tireless dedicated organizing work the current election has turned. It's not lost on any of us that this same black radical imagination has been embodied in the music of Detroit natives like Alice Coltrane, Turiya Sangeetananda, Aretha Franklin, and of course, Jerry Allen, all conjuring insistent speculative futures that include the flourishing of black people. In recent years, I became a little obsessed with the word musicality. There's something wrong with it, but perhaps in a productive way. It's a peculiar term that gets used in antithetical ways. On the one hand, for scientists, musicality names the evolved capacity for music, something the entire human species is presumed to possess. On the other hand, to the general English speaker, musicality denotes an exceptional aesthetic judgment, a special quality conferred on selected performances or on a small handful of exemplary individuals. We praise a person's particular form perform performance by describing it as particularly musical. By extension, then most performances of music presumably fall short, failing to earn this special designation. If most music fails to exhibit musicality, a capacity that nonetheless all human beings, again, are said to possess, musicality then becomes some kind of paradoxic, paradoxical concept, one that both precedes and exceeds music itself. That very instability makes the term particularly ripe as a productive critical concept. If musicality is a quality that a person may possess, then the, that attribution is subject to notions of what music is and what a person is. The so-called music sciences depend on the coherence and stability of both the category of music and the category of the human being. For the rest of us in the arts, humanities, social sciences, and just in the world, it is apparent that the human being as a political category, that idea is capable of excluding entire populations. And by extension, the category of music is also capable of excluding entire music. We get waylaid by the stickiness of nouns like music and the human being, words that almost by virtue of their generality become freighted with intention, desire, and power. If instead we adopt musicing, Christopher Small's now quite familiar verb that critiques the noun, we might similarly consider the Jamaican theorist Sylvia Winter's critique of the category of the human as a Western project that overrepresents the human as white and male in its stead, she develops a framework of being human as praxis. Then qualities of musicality or humanness can be ascribed to actions, behaviors, practices, relations, rather than to objects or beings. We can consider what constitutes a musical action or a musical relation. Musicality might then name a special sticky quality within musicking, some aspect of a musical act that captures and observer's attention. One waits or attends or listens because one is somehow captured or drawn in by a musical action. Our capacities to hear and be affected or caught by the musical actions of another or to produce musical actions that affect or capture a listening other suggest an understanding of musicality as sociality up close and aural empathy or attraction or intimacy. This framework does not simply depend on the presence or absence or ontological status of music or beings, but instead emphasizes musicality as an affective relation across networks of beings, objects, and systems. One of our graduate students, Anna Yu Wang, once described her experience of musicality in witnessing a performance of traditional Chinese choreography. In her description, she spontaneously uttered a phrase that has stuck with me ever since you feel guided, that you and you feel guided, this phrase, is the attending subject, that is you, the observer, who deem an observed other as a fellow human being worthy of your attention. The word feel locates this response in the realm of affect or experiential intensity. And the word guided suggests the recognition of an action as a made or done or considered or intended thing the trace of the hand, the body, the ear, the aesthetic of another. 
of someone who has taken the action to mark, activate, and enliven their world for you. You feel guided. A subject is caught by this new intensely forged intersubjective link. Musicality becomes a directed sociality, a way of sensing and feeling held by the trace of another being who acts toward and for you. You feel their hand guiding your senses and that feeling is arrested, is arresting. Musicality names how we perceive and are held by the sounds of another, how we hail or call to each other. This felicitous phrase, you feel guided, reveals the entanglement of subjectivity, affect, and power at the heart of musicality. Developing this word musicality, which as I told you, I'm obsessed with, <laughs> as a critical concept in this way, helps dislodge our listening from hierarchies of mus musical objects and instead allows us to attend to possible ways of listening and sounding, potential processes by which actions might become musical, contingent relational emergent musicalities. Indeed, we, not, we need not presume a singular prevailing notion of musicality, but instead we might imagine many musicalities for many life worlds, many praxis of being human. As considered and theorized by generations of black scholars, the constellation of practices referred to as black music confers sonic life on such fugitive relational qualities, embodied listening, heterarchical interaction, call and response, moving together in time, ecstatic transcendence. As Fred Moten wrote, quote, the animative materiality the aesthetic, political, sexual, and racial force of the ensemble of objects that we might call Black performances, Black history, Blackness, is a real problem and a real chance for the philosophy of the human being, which would necessarily bear and be irreducible to what is called, or what somebody might hope to someday call, subjectivity." End quote. Let us therefore hear Black musicking as a ritual space for Black speculative musicalities, sonically disruptive practices that posit new ways of becoming musical, otherwise possibilities for Black life and Black subjectivities, and radical futurities for the philosophy of the human being, as Fred put it. In deciding which facets of Jerry Allen's speculative musicalities to share in this space, I considered what about her first grabbed my attention 32 years ago. Her hands first showed up to my young ears as spiders, scampering through multidimensional cracks in the rhythm. Those hands produced spare, spindly melodies, weaving and twisting around the harmonies and leaving gauzy trails that accumulated into something majestic, an odd, enchanted spider web spun into the corner of a song, strange and delicate. Those ephemeral lines first appearing as spontaneous drops into the abyss turned out to be structural moves executed with care, determination, and foresight. I had the ongoing sense that the owner of these hands not only possessed pers perspicacious insight into whatever piece of music she was playing, but that she managed also to hear whatever that song wasn't yet saying. And that was the exact space where she would begin her work in the time-honored Black radical tradition of exceeding any and all frames. Such was our impression of Jerry Allen, the pianist, as documented on other people's recordings, a constant source of sly, wry conjurings and disruptions, chromatic dislocations and interventions. She seemed to glide unbothered from mastery to transgression and back. Her improvisations were full of space, thought, listening, and a liberatory quality. Her groove was deep. Her two-hand independence seemed often shocking. Her lines and voicings were fresh and unique. She would seem at times to play with great reserves of calm, but when she chose to step up, she would dazzle with fearless virtuosity. She could make a piano sigh, whisper, chortle, shriek, and roar. I want to share with you uh, a transcription of Jerry Allen's piano playing on somebody else's music. This is a, a piece called The Short End of the Stick, recorded by the Ralph Peterson Quintet 
from their 1989 album, V. This band also includes bassist Phil Bowler, trumpeter Terrence Blanchard, and saxophonist Steve Wilson. So now comes the awkward part of the Zoom where I share my screen, so bear with me for a sec. Um, let's see, I've got too many. Hmm. Um, right, okay. Here we are. Okay, so first I just wanna give you a, a quick, I mean, this, the, the solo I'm gonna play is about um, 90 seconds. So first I just wanna give you a quick sense of the shape of the piece. So this is again, Ralph Peterson's composition. It has this 10, uh, 10 bar vamp at the top of the form, uh, about 14 bars of changes, another uh, eight bars of vamp and then another 10 bar vamp and then this break. Okay, so that's the shape of the chorus that they're cycling through that she's playing. And I'm um, just going to uh, kick it off right around the time she enters and I'll show you. I hope you can hear all this. <laughs> that was a lot, uh, a lot of information in a very short time. Um, uh, just to close here, um, the experience of transcribing this solo felt odd because the musicalities that I referred to earlier, the qualities that caught my ear, that called to me, that captured me, seem unremarkable on the page and the standard tactics of analysis seem to deflate what is exceptional about the creativities and musicalities at work here. What captured and fascinated me was not how she plays the changes, which I didn't even know until I transcribed them, nor how she builds her solo. It was how she expresses time fearlessly unbothered by Ralph Peterson's fusillades. How she on occasion emanates out of the ensemble texture and what Arthur Jaffa after Fred Moten likened to a solar flare, seeming to swerve away from the form only then to miraculously land with Peterson's drums, proving that she was with him the whole time. How she seems to always be wholly, be both wholly with and strikingly other than the band. I remain mystified in particular by the surprising absence of chords. There are rarely more than two notes sounding at once. Somehow she constructs dancing arcs of affective intensity without resorting to sonic saturation, rhythmic density, or excessive sustain. Let's call them quiet shouts. For example, you may have noticed that uh, little passage of dyads towards the end that might be notated as mezzo piano and yet they feel momentous, even climactic. The sparse yet pervasive left hand stabs also hold a clue as they are never not in rhythm, often landing on eighth note upbeats that lock tightly with the drum and bass. They convey a subtle rhythmic grounding, a quiet self-assurance 
that she is rhythmically not alone and need not force the music. The resulting spaces in her solo express a generosity to her bandmates. She is not looking to dominate the conversation, but rather to motivate, propel, and stretch with the ensemble. The silences in her playing and the tradition of soloists like Ahmad Jamal, Shirley Horn, Wadada Leo Smith, and many others signify key moments of listening and interdependence. And most of all, what captivated me in the late 1980s as I heard this for the first time was how her hands would dance, how the structures and rhythms of her hands generated a contrasting, productive musical form of their own. The solo's closing six bars, this two-handed triplet salvo, followed by a signature one-handed tumble arriving impeccably on the last chord, showcase the speculative work of the hands, their power to imagine new musicalities that intervene on and push against song form and metrical form. If this was all you knew about Jerry Allen, her way of transforming someone else's band by calmly inhabiting, dancing in, and shouting from its margins, you might be a fan, but you would also be wholly unprepared for her own music. Imagine a sturdy, splendid palace built entirely from these peculiar details found in these spider webs, the splayed intervals proliferating and surrounding you as ostinati, the jagged errant lines somehow doubled, orchestrated, even sung, the asymmetric rhythms stacked in contrapuntal towers, all the mercurial tendencies in her piano playing suddenly solidified and given full force. It was that same aesthetic from the margins, now made thrillingly central. This was the musical language of Jerry Allen, clear, ebullient, resoundingly complete. She was a bright light among us, a friend, teacher, and nurturer to many, myself included, and every facet of her majestic life, Jerry Allen's entire praxis of being human is bracingly audible in the mercurial, unshakable, guiding musicality of her hands. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vijay, for that wonderful, wonderful talk. Uh, we are going to keep the schedule moving forward uh, to our next speaker, uh, who's my colleague, Yoko Suzuki. Uh, Yoko Suzuki earned a PhD in ethnomusicology and a PhD certificate in gender, sexuality, and women's studies at the University of Pittsburgh. Her research, which explores the intersection of race, gender, and sexuality in jazz performance, has been published in academic journals, including Black Music Research Journal, American Music Review, uh, and Gender, Education, Music, and Society. She currently teaches at the University of Pittsburgh and performs widely as a jazz saxophonist. And her piece is titled, Searching for a New Place, Exploratory Process in Jerry Allen's Compositions and Performances. Yoko Suzuki. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I, I really would like to thank Michael Heller uh, for all the work for this conference and also for editing the uh, special issue of the journal. And then also, um, I would like to thank Ali Hisama for this, this work for organizing. And then also Ali and um, Sherry Tucker for uh, this, this long-term mentorship. Without them, I would not have been here. So thank you. Um, Professor Allen and I were sitting across the desk in her office on March 17, 2017, around noon. She had recently returned to school um, after a six month medical leave. I asked her to meet with me to talk about a live performance of Unconditional Love with Esperanza Spaulding and Terry Lynn Carrington, which I was planning to discuss in a conference presentation the following week. She looked well, but I could see that she did not have a lot of energy. She appeared to be slightly offended when I suggested that this particular performance of Unconditional Love seemed to go outside the form. Quote, we always follow the form, unquote. She assured me, I replied, quote, would you listen to this? So I quickly found a YouTube clip of the performance on my laptop and played it for her. She listened with her eyes closed and soon a smile appeared on her face. Well, it's like mining. You mean like searching or exploring? 
Yes. According to Alan, the trio was searching for something, and this is where Spalding's ability to take a song to a new place manifested. Bassist Dwayne Dolphin also recalled to me a similar reference to searching for a place in describing his own, own memories of performing with Alan. Quote, Jerry, Jerry would say, Dwayne, go to a place, and then I, I have to find where it is, unquote. This article examines Alan's music with an emphasis on with an emphasis on how her compositions, arrangements, and improvisation explored such new places. The term Alan used to describe musically unknown materials. Through interviews with Alan and several of her colleagues, including Terry Carrington, Esperanza Spaulding, Dario Hall, and Casa Overall, as well as analysis of several of her her compositions, arrangements, and live performances. I argue that Alan was constantly searching for something new in her musical creations. This attitude suggests that Alan prioritized the collective creative processes over the finished products. Her musical creations were greatly informed by African-American cultural tradition and can be further elucidated by Fumi Okiji's notion of storytelling as a communal enterprise in which stories remain incomplete and open-ended. I explore these themes in examples from two of Alan's primary performing units during the final years of her life, Timeline featuring Kenny Davis, Casa Overall, and Morris Chestnut and the ACS trio with Terry Lynn Carrington and Esperanza Spaulding. As an example of a collective creative process, I discussed her ori original song titled Philly Joe, uh, performed by the Timeline Band. As the title suggests, this song is inspired by and dedicated to the drummer Philly Joe Jones. According to Casa Overall, the song was initially a groove with a bass drum pattern she came up with during the, their European tour. Quote, I think it was at the airport somewhere. She said something like, I want you to learn this rhythm and started singing me the bass drum part, unquote. Overall described it, bum, 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 bum. He continued, quote, I wrote it out and then we jammed on it at the sound check soon after for a while. During jamming, someone, either Kenny or Jerry, played the bass, bass line turnaround, unquote. The rest of the composition gradually came together while rehearsing and performing it many times. Recently, so after I finished writing this article, overall found the recording of the sound check and shared it with me. So I would like to play it. <laughs> you get the idea. So we he hear a synthesizer sound, which is a micro cog Alan brought on tour. Um, it seems that Alan was trying to establish the groove first using uh, a micro cog, then moved it to the piano, freely playing and experimenting with new ideas over the groove. They continued to play about 15 minutes. And this is how the basic elements of this song were created collectively. Then later, they added the introduction and the ending, which is a transcription of a Philly Joe Jones solo from Night and the Day, 
performed by the Bill Evans Trio in 1958. So here is a video uh, from the Detroit International um, Festival. Um, yeah, the Detroit International Jazz Festival in 2009, and it includes the introduction and the ending. We're going to continue now with something that we wrote for the great Philly Joe Jones. This is called Philly Joe, and it features our tap percussionist, Maurice Chestnut. So I, as you probably heard, she announced this song as um, we are going to continue now with something that we wrote for the great Philly Joe Jones. So she acknowledged that uh, they collectively um, created this song. Um, as of the writing of this article, there were four different versions uh, available. And actually recently another version came up on YouTube. So I have to listen to it carefully. But um, so while they these ver different versions share more or less fixed elements, they all develop differently. So in the article, I described each version, how uh, it is stretched organically. Um, Dario Hall, the bassist who played with the Timeline Band for several years, mainly for the Euro European tours, uh, told me about this song, Philly Joe, quote, like most complex group ideas, it was an organic process of development. The ideas clearly originated from Jerry, but it would be a sketch either on paper or in her head or recorded previously on a device and played back during our rehearsal. We'd play it and usually for a long time because she seemed to be searching where the idea could go next. Maybe the drummer or I would do something and she would stop to say, use that. It would, get, it would get exhausting like playing a basketball game to continuously play these grooves over and over until it arrived to where she wanted it, unquote. Strikingly, Hall also used the word searching to describe Alan's music making, again, paralleling the metaphors of place referenced above. In the article, I also discussed the ACS Trio's performance of Unconditional Love, which exemplified the type of exploration and the creation for which Alan always aimed. While Alan performed this song with the different groups, it became a staple of the ACS Trio's repertoire, and the group often concluded their sets with this song. I suggest that this song evolved significantly over the course of these repeated performances. So in the article, I discuss several different versions of this song, um, but I, I would like to play uh, the version actually I was discussing with um, Jerry in the conversation um, that I quoted at the beginning. So. Here's the part that I was talking about with her around here. Oh, <laughs> 
So I, I know we don't have much time. So this is available on YouTube. So um, probably uh, you can watch it on YouTube. Um, so the ways Alan created the music um, in compositions, arrangements, and improvisation demonstrate that she was more concerned with the process of collective exploration and the creative urgency than with the finished product. This approach to artistic practice can be illuminated by Fumio Kiji's reconceptualized notion of storytelling. Quote, the notion that a story is started and finished by a single soloist fails to account for the communal nature of oral traditions, unquote. Okiji considers the storytelling in jazz improvisation to be, quote, a shared reiterative undertaking involving a collective of desperate, desperate, part, desperate participants, both living and deceased, unquote. While Okiji highlights the undertakings by a number of different participants from the past and the present. I suggest that this notion of storytelling story as incomplete and open-ended can also shed light on a long-term creative processes, process of individual artists and groups of musicians, and it can be extended to the processes of com uh, jazz compositions and the and arrangements that are constantly revised and recreated. As seen in the versions of Unconditional Love and the processes involved in her compositions of Philly Joe and her arrangement of Four by Five, Allen's artistic practice continually employed collective music making that heavily relied on such a shared reiterative undertakings. As a result, Allen's performances demonstrate the continuity between the past of the jazz tradition, the past of her own compositional material, the present of her collaborative groups, groups at the given moment, and the future of musical places yet undiscovered. Thank you. Wonderful, thanks for you so much, Dr. Suzuki. Uh, okay, it is 10.52. This has just been unbelievably beautiful already. Um, since this is a long morning session, we're now going to take a brief break uh, for about 10 minutes just to give everyone a chance to catch their breath. Uh, and then when we come back, we will introduce Dwight Andrews, who will be our next speaker. Uh, during the break, though, we are going to play some videos of Jerry Allen. Uh, we're actually going to play portions of two performances from the Pitt Jazz Seminar. The first is going to be a duo with Kenny Barron playing Mary Lou Williams's What's the Story, Morning Glory. And then the second is from 2016 playing Dr. Billy T Taylor's uh, I Wish I Knew How It Would Feel to Be Free. So if you want to stick around during the break, you can enjoy those. Otherwise, we'll be back in 10 minutes.
Kenny Barron. Uh, this is this is a song that was written by um, a great jazz pianist, um, and it's his signature piece. And actually, Jerry and I performed it at his uh, memorial service. It's Mr. Billy Taylor, Dr. Billy Taylor.
that every man should be free. Thank you.